So in 1838, there's going to be an election for who is going to replace Houston as president of the Republic of Texas. Now, Houston himself is not going to run. He can't run because uh, the consecutive presidency rule. So he's got to sit out for the next three years. But he's going to find an ally to run for him uh, in his place, basically execute his same policies, peace with the Indians, trying to gain international recognition, things like that. Well, unfortunately, Houston's first choice for uh, the presidential candidate is going to kill himself. I believe that guy had debt issues, something like that. He's going to get a second choice. Um, That guy will also kill himself. I'm not 100% sure, but I believe that guy kills himself over uh, issues with a potential marriage partner, something like that. They're also getting politically attacked by... Uh, Houston's opponent, which is Mirabu Lamar, who will be running for president under the Lamar Party. And this is one of the things that by 1838, the divisions between Lamar and Houston had grown so much that essentially you have the Houston Party and the anti-Houston Party under Mirabu Lamar. Well, the Houston Party is not looking so great because two of their candidates already killed themselves. And so the Lamar Party candidate, Lamar, uh, is going to have a pretty easy time winning the presidency and taking over as president of the Republic of Texas in 1839. Once Lamar gets in president, uh, Houston steps down. Uh, Lamar is going to start executing Uh, these changes in the government they're gonna go a lot of ways opposite of what Houston did okay so one of the first things Lamar is gonna do and this is probably the thing he's most famous for in Texas history is he's going to implement a number of educational uh, bills or or he's gonna implement a lot of reforms that are going to be meant to provide education to the people of Texas for example um, one, he's going to pass through a bill, and what this bill will do is require every county, so basically Texas is uh, subdivided into counties, it's going to require every county to set aside land for public schools. Lamar, very well educated, poet, things like that, he believes that the Republic of Texas needs to uh, be strong. And as a matter of fact, one of uh, Lamar's biggest policies is we don't need to worry about annexation. The United States rejected us. We need to be strong on our own. We need to stand as our own independent nation. And part of that is getting education for our future generations. So, you know, we need scientists, we need artists, mathematicians, things like that. And the only way you can do that is if you have a pro- strong public education system. So this bill will set up, um, uh, require counties to set aside land for schools. And the bill also sets aside land for two universities to be built in the future. Now, the universities aren't going to be built. As a matter of fact, they're not going to be built until after the Civil War. But the land is going to be put aside. And this land is later going to be used for the University of Texas, the University of Texas A&M. So, Lamar, big guy uh, as far as education. And as a matter of fact, uh, a lot of schools, including my middle school, are named after Mirabu Lamar. Again, part of this is uh, towards this policy, stronger Texas. We don't need annexation. The United States rejected us. Let's stand on our own. So he's pushing towards a stronger uh, national government and pushing towards education. Another of uh, Lamar's policies concerning the government is going to concern the capital. So under Houston, the capital had been in Houston. Well, Houston had proved to be a cesspool. There was uh, mud, dirt in the streets. You know, it was uh, disease everywhere, stagnant pools of water, uh, frequently flooded. I mean, it was just a nightmare. Well, Mirabu Lamar is going to say for these reasons he's moving the capital. But some people think he's moving the capital just because he doesn't like Houston, doesn't want to serve out of a city named after his political rival. And so what he's going to decide is we should move the capital closer to the interior and he's going to, uh, uh, this new city, Austin, named after the recently passed Stephen F. Austin. So he wants to move from Houston to Austin. Uh, and in 1839, he's going to begin the process of moving this capital. Now, as we're going to talk about, kind of makes sense to get away from the coast, uh, especially before you have all these disease prevention, prevention um, uh, that we have in modern times. But this is going to be exposed to Plains Indians, and it's a lot closer to Mexico uh, than Houston. It's, uh, it's going to open up uh, the capital to perspective problems. 
But again, Lamar's just thinking, it's not Houston, uh, let's get out of there. So he'll start moving the archives, all the uh, Republic of Texas records, to Austin. So again, very different policies than Sam Houston. Uh, this would be Austin right around the time it's formed. Uh, just a very small, it's, it's nothing there really when the capital moves there. All right, so that's one way that uh, Lamar is going to be different than Houston. Another way is going to be in Lamar's Indian policy. So Houston was generally make peace with Indians, forgive little indiscretions, um, just for the overall goal of peace. Lamar, and again, Houston, when concerning the uh, eastern tribes, Mississippi culture tribes like the Cherokees, thought you could have this biracial society and live alongside each other. Lamar is going to be the opposite. As a matter of fact, when Lamar gets into office, he is going to advocate what he calls, quote, the prosecution of an exterminating war on Indians. And he says that this war will only end, quote, in their extinction or total expulsion. So whereas Houston wants to make peace, live alongside Indians, Lamar wants to get rid of them, basically. Um, he... Just a, uh, like a lot of people in the United States at the time, Andrew Jackson, things like that, does not think that uh, whites and Indians can coexist. So in this line of thinking, what Lamar is going to do is basically hire a huge state or national funded Texas Republic funded police force called the Texas Rangers. As we've talked about before, there had been Texas Rangers before, but this was usually people hired on temporary basis, maybe Indians raided, you get together some local people, pay them a couple bucks, they retaliate against the Indian group, then they disband. Um, maybe out there ranging for a couple months at the time. But what you're going to see under Lamar is the birth of what you would call the, even the modern rangers isn't the right word, the birth of the rangers as we understand them today. A national funded group, again later on it's going to be state funded when Texas joins the United States, uh, of people that are going to serve long term, long term meaning more than a couple months usually, uh, year terms, a lot of times people re-enlist uh, for multiple years, and they're going to be paid by the capital, and they're going to be, again, ranging sometimes on a permanent basis. It's not just in retaliation for something. So the Rangers are truly going to get their teeth under Lamar. Uh, Lamar is going to receive funding. We'll talk about exactly how he does that shortly for some 800 men to patrol the frontier with the idea that stopping Indian raids from groups like the Comanches, Apaches, uh, Wichita's, uh, and also from the uh, uh, Indian Territory. We'll talk more about that in a second. And so it's basically a mounted cavalry. So 2.5 million in total Lamar is going to spend on these Rangers forces. So what is Lamar going to do now that he has these huge armed men that uh, is armed cavalry? What is he going to do with them? Well, the first group that will feel the wrath of these Rangers is going to be the Cherokees. Okay, so we talked about the Cherokees who uh, had, again, first come to Texas under Spanish period claim, but I, we still, as far as I know, don't have historical evidence that they ever got land title from Spain. They're going to claim this title, live in northeast Texas under Mexico. Mexico never get random land title. Now, Sam Houston wanted to give them this land, but uh, was unable to do so because the Congress wouldn't authorize it. But they have these Cherokees living in Texas again for, at this point, it's been 15, 16, 17 years, something like that. Uh, actually, closer, closer to 20 years. I've uh, been living here for uh, this long period of time. Um, Lamar is basically going to say these guys don't have rightful title to their land and they had participated in the Cordova Rebellion uh, in 1838, so they're enemies of the state. Not only that, but in 1839, a different party of Mexicans is coming up here uh, to East Texas to basically try the Cordova Rebellion again, incite the Tejanos up here perhaps go speak with the Cherokees. Now this group's going to be intercepted before they reach the Cherokees, but the way Lamar is going to look at this is, you know, uh, if they had um, got up here, the Cherokees would have joined them uh, like we basically they uh, were suspected of doing under, under the Cordova Rebellion. And the Mexican authorities are not only going to be speaking to the Cherokees, but some of these other Eastern Texas uh, or Eastern United States groups 
uh, that had moved to Texas alongside the Cherokees, including a group called the Kickapoos that we'll talk about later. So you have evidence that the uh, Cherokees, you know, it's not, they hadn't even reached them. Again, the second group uh, hadn't even reached the Cherokees, but they're suspected of possibly plotting with Mexico. And again, previously, uh, uh, Chief Bull had even talked about joining with Mexico if they didn't receive land recognition from the Republic of Texas. So again, Houston was hoping to settle the matter by giving them land recognition. That's not going to be Lamar's policy. Lamar, in July 1839, will order the Cherokees uh you have to leave basically you have to leave well the cherokees are going to say okay we understand they don't want to leave their land but they're going to argue it's july we're about to harvest our corn we need food for the winter something we don't think about today but you, you obviously got to have food for the winter can we please have a couple weeks well uh the mars going to say no you've got to leave now cherokees are going to try to hold out until their crops are done uh, it's at this point um, uh, their chief bull will say, you know, we're not leaving just yet. Well, Lamar, what he will do is he's going to send uh, the Texas Rangers among the Cherokees. This wouldn't be Cherokees because there are teepees here. Cherokees didn't live in teepees. But the uh, Rangers go among the Cherokees, start shooting them up, kill dozens of Cherokees, including Chief Bull. Um, again, Houston is uh, friends with Chief Bull, so it's kind of interesting. The One of the Rangers sneaks up behind him. Shoots Chief Bull, kills him, uh, it shoots him in the head, basically blood splatters everywhere. And one of Lamar's men is going to take Chief Bull's hat, uh, give it to Houston. Like, here's here's the hat of your friend, we just killed him. So, complete opposite of Houston. Um, so, the Cherokees, what they're going to do after running is they will basically flee north up to join the Cherokees that had moved to Oklahoma Territory under... Um, uh, under um, uh, the United States. The United States had forced to move these Cherokees over here. So they're going to join their uh, relatives up here. We'll also see these other Eastern Texas Indians. Uh, after seeing what happened to the Cherokees, Lamar will order them to leave. So they're going to go uh, as well. The Caddo's, the few that remain behind in this area, they're going to end up joining these Wichita's o over here to the western region because they basically see how things have, have turned. So they're going to go past the line of settlement to this area out here near the Brazos River. And so we see the Wichita's and the Caddo's, it's almost like they merge. Again, the Wichita's, Caddo-like, sedentary agriculturalists some of the time, um, you know, hunter-gatherers some of the time. The Caddo's, purely sedentary agriculturalists, but now as they're sort of facing this encroachment by these Americans, will be forced to move west. Um, again, uh, uh, other, other Eastern Indian groups are, are uh, forcing them uh, to get out of here. So uh, we've already got the uh, Caranquas, essentially, they've been driven to extinction during the Mexican period. Caddo's forced uh, to move uh, west here. These eastern T Indian groups that had uh, moved uh, into uh, Texas, they're forced to move up to Indian territory. Essentially, the only Indian group that's left in East Texas is a small group of Alabama Cushadas that had started living in East Texas under... Um, uh, under uh, Nemeseo Salcedo, and they'd sort of just stayed here on this small plot of land. They cooperated with the Americans moving in. Uh, again, they're Mississippi culture groups, so they're sedentary agriculturalists. Well, somebody is going to ask Lamar, do we get rid of these guys as well? Lamar will, quote, say, they're a weakless and defenseless tribe, not to be dreaded. And he's going to allow these Alabama Cushadas to stay in. Kind of interestingly, um, 1840, they'll be granted four leagues of land, um, uh, and 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 shortly after that, they'll their land will actually be reduced a little bit further. Uh, and what's going to happen is uh, some Alabama Cushadas will move up here uh, t just to uh, squat on some of these Indian lands up here uh, that have been moved west by the United States. But a handful, about 200 or so, are going to remain down here on this uh, small plot of land here in East Texas. And today there's an Indian reservation there. This is the only Indian reservation in the eastern part of Texas, uh, and it's just a small Alabama Cushada uh, land. So very small tribe, and again, they're able to stay because they're so small, and then um, that uh, Mirabu Lamar doesn't view them as a threat. Well, what about these Tonkawas? So Tonkawas, we haven't talked about them for a while, but they are the amalgamation group that all these groups dying of disease, you know, the introduction of the Spanish, the horse, the Apache pressure. A lot of Indian tribes had just sort of fallen apart, come together to form the Tonkawas in this hill country. 
Again, they hunt deer. They also ride horses. Uh, well, their population had been dwindled to about a uh, 1,000 by the time Mirabu Lamar gets into office. Well, what the Tonkwas are going to do, and this is about the time you'll start to see this American Texan uh, uh, encroachment on their territory, they're going to end up surviving and being able to stay in this area at least for the next couple dozen years because what they're going to do is work with the Texans. So the Texas Rangers, uh, as they're starting to go out on campaign against these various groups, we're about to talk about them uh, against the Comanches and the Lee Ponds, but as they're going out, they don't know how to track Indians. Well, the Tonka was due. They've been fighting the Comanches for a long time at this point, 100 years. And so they know where, you know, this is what Comanche tracks look like. So they're going to end up being able to survive and make their way by joining with the Rangers. And then we'll later see when the United States government comes in, joining with them and serving, serving as Indian auxiliaries. So they're going to manage to fight uh or retain their territory at least for a little bit longer. So Lamar is not going to to deal with them. So and again during Lamar's presidency, they're sort of at the edge of this uh, settlement settlement place as well. So it's not like you know the, like the uh, Cherokees, Alabama Cushadas, Caddos, who are by this point surrounded by American settlers. All right. So what about the big guys? What about the Comanches? So uh, and so this would be. Uh, a Wichita Village right there. But what about the Comanches? Well, the Comanches are going to start facing these Texas Rangers, but Lamar realizes that to deal with the Comanches, they're so expensive, are so expansive that in order to fight them, it's going to cost even more than he's devoting to the Texas Rangers right now. So it's going to take a long time to, if we want to send out expeditions on the plains to attack them at their homes, which is really the only way to defeat the Comanches. So if we want to defeat them for a long time, then what we're going to have to do is spend money. And we, as we're going to talk about, he, uh, Lamar's willing to go into debt, but he's not willing to go into that much debt. So what his plan will be is to make a temporary peace with the Comanches, but he's going to want to make demands of the Comanches. So in 1840, he and well his representatives will uh, go out to meet with what they think is the head of the Comanches. It's actually the head of one band of Comanches. So while the Comanches generally operate with political cohesion, they're separated into different bands. These bands sort of operate in individual areas. And um, this is just one of uh, of a, l a number of bands for the Comanche. So it's not all of them, but that's what Lamar's government believes they are. So, um, uh, again, Houston had tried to form this peace policy with the Comanches, hadn't been able to get the Republic of Texas to approve of it, but we, we'd had a couple raids from the Comanches. But uh, Lamar, he's going to want to get these captives back from the Comanches, like Cynthia Ann Parker and a lot of these other uh, captives of his started been captured by the Comanches. So when his represents representatives meet with them, they're going to say, all right, we will consider signing and approving this peace policy that Houston had with you. Again, Lamar can't afford to take on the Comanches full force in 1840, it, but um, uh, we'll consider it, but we want you to bring in every Texan captive that you, you have among you. Well, the particular band, they are going to arrive in San Antonio at this meeting place. They're going to decide to meet in San Antonio. Uh, about 65 of them are going to come in with a handful of captives. So the thing about these captives is obviously not all the Comanche captives because this is one particular band. And the com captives they do bring horribly mistreated. One of these things about the Comanches is uh, a lot of times you're adopted into the tribe and eventually captives will be accepted into the tribe but a lot of times they go through horrendous torture before this has happened like uh there's one uh a, a little girl among this uh matilda lockhart they when she gets to san antonio uh they're going to see that her nose has been cut off um other Coman uh, comanche captives have been burned things like that very horribly treated you'll see people say no they weren't that horribly treated that, no they absolutely were absolutely horribly been treated it's just the comanche way um and so now you have these texans these representatives of the mark government now they're going to see that um uh these comanches have kept uh treated these captives horribly and they're not all the captives again so there's about 65 comanches show up in san antonio 
Lamar's representatives to see what see the Comanches they brought. They're going to end up meeting with them, uh, the Comanches, the 65 Comanches, in this place called the Council House in downtown San Antonio. And when they meet, they will begin to discuss. Oh, here would be a uh, uh, Matilda Lockhart. Yeah, this is a uh, you burn the feet to prevent them from running away. But when they meet in this council house, they'll confront the Comanches. Why uh, did you treat these captives so poorly? Where's the rest of the captives? Well, they're trying to do this through a translator. There's a lot of confusion. And uh, the Comanches aren't going to have the answers the Texas leaders want. So the Texas leaders will decide to lock those Comanches in the council house until the other captives are returned. Again, misunderstanding how the Comanches operate so they lock the door well the Comanches look at this they view this as a trap um, we didn't talk about it. the Spanish have done similar things like this to before uh, to them before I lock them in they think they're about to die again you know they don't have the captives because it's not their band that's in possession of the captives so they don't know what to do so we'll see these these Comanches just begin to fight and we're gonna have something known as the council house fight uh, erupt so basically uh, half the Comanches are going to start fighting, half are going to uh, uh, kill, um, uh, be killed, the other half are going to be locked up. Um, now, if some of the people within the uh, uh, fight are going to be women. These women are going to be kept captive. Some of the men will, will be kept captive, but most of the men are going to be killed in this council house fight. Well, what the Texas representatives are going to decide to do is take one of the Comanche women, send her to go speak with the other Comanches and tell them that they're going to get the remainder of their Comanches um, relatives back once the rest of the American captives are returned. So this woman is going to return to her band and she's going to tell them, you know, they tricked us. We were having a peace meeting. Uh, they end up killing half of us and they end up, uh, uh, you know, they basically um, uh, took the rest of us captive. Well, the Comanches at the time are under a leader named Buffalo Hump. This is probably not a picture of Buffalo Hump. This is probably his son, um, Buffalo Hump. But, you know, this is the only picture that uh, is available. Uh, Buffalo Hump, by the way, is not named Buffalo Hump. Uh, this is a sort of cleaned up version of his name. Buffalo, it's Buffalo something else. I'll, I'll let you guys look up what it, what his name actually uh, is. It's Buffalo. Anyway, um... So the Comanches at the time are under this guy named Buffalo Hump. He's learned that these Texans have betrayed uh, what the Comanches view as a sacred peace, peace agreement. You know, they, they've uh, locked these guys in the fight in this council house and killing them in the council house fight. So Buffalo Hump is going to gather together uh, a number of Comanche warriors, about 500, um, uh, 500 members of their family, so about 1,000 Comanches all together. And what they're going to do is they're going to start this massive raid into the interior of uh, the Republic of Texas. So there had been raids on the frontier areas for a while here, but raids down here, there hadn't been very many for a long time. Well, what we're going to see is, is Buffalo Hump's forces will come down here. They're first going to hit Victoria. This is going to catch the people of Victoria by complete surprise. On August 6, uh, 1840, they're going to kill a number of settlers, a number of slaves. They're going to take about 15,000 horses. Um, now, some people are going to manage to survive because they're going to run to this uh, fortified building in the interior of the settlement. But anybody caught outside of there will um, be killed by the Comanches. Uh, after this, the Comanches are going to head in this direction. They're going to make camp for the night, uh, find some wagons on the way down towards this Linville area. Well, uh, people of Linville had been warned that the Comanches were coming. So when the Comanches arrive in Linville, uh, they're going to uh, be on these boats when the Comanches show up. Um, interesting thing is when the uh, they arrive at Linville, there would recently been these, um, these shipments that had just shown up carrying like uh, fine goods from New Orleans. So there's like top hats, there's umbrellas, things like that. Uh, and basically the Comanches are going to take these when they take Linville. So a lot of people survive because they're out on boats, um, but they do take um, some captives. They're going to take uh, additional uh, horses, bringing the number of horses up to 3,000, and then all these crazy goods that uh, they found that had just recently arrived from New Orleans. So it's sort of this comical scene where the Comanches just put on a lot of these clothing and then they're sort of dragging all these goods that they captured back in Linville and they're deep inside what they would call 
Indian Territory. It's at this point that the Texas Rangers will arrive on the scene. So shortly after raiding Linville, the Comanches are going to try to return to the Southern Plains, but they're going to be overburdened with all the goods, horses, things like that, the handful of captives they captured. Um, they're going to be overburdened with this. You can't move very fast with this stuff. Well, this is going to allow this new Texas Ranger, a guy named Jack Hayes. Uh, you'll see him, uh, John Coffee Hayes. You'll sometimes see his name uh, written that way. Well, Jack Hayes is very experienced fighting Indians. There's a lot of uh, history behind Jack Hayes, how he learns this experience. I personally think he learned it from uh, some of the Spanish officers that had been fighting the Comanches before this. They, uh, you know, um, their children taught, they taught this to their children. And then uh, Jack Hayes was a friends with a number of uh, Mexican families that had previously fought Indians. I think maybe he learned it from them. But he learned the way the Comanches operate in battle. He learned how to best attack them. So he's going to set on the Comanches, and he's going to decisively defeat them in this Battle of Plum Creek. Well, this is going to elevate Jack Hayes to prominence, and Jack Hayes is going to start incorporating this new expanded um, Rangers uh, under Lamar. He's going to start training these Rangers in the ways that he's learned to fight these Comanches. And from this point forward, the Rangers are going to become incredibly effective at stopping both the Comanches and the Apaches. So effective, as a matter of fact, that whenever the Comanches and Apaches uh, raid into the Republic of Texas, there's a good chance the Texas Rangers are going to be able to, to come right after them. And this is right around the time they start using Tonkawa scouts as well. So the Comanches learn about 1850. Rangers have grown. <clears throat> there's a lot more of them than there had been before they're operating on a permanent basis they have this jack hayes guy leading them organizing them he's very good at his job they're employing tonkawas that can allow uh, them to track us better and we'll see the rangers start operating where if the comanches attack uh like they do in linville and, and again um, a number of uh uh, Buffalo Humps band, some of them will get away, a number are going to be killed by Jack Hayes, but they realize that, like in this instance, the uh, uh, Linville Victoria raids, that basically um, you're going to die or you're, they're going to catch up to you and they're going to maybe come out on the plains to attack your families. It's bad news to attack in this direction. Now, Comanche attacks and Apache attacks are not going to stop entirely 1840, but we'll see the Comanches begin to realize this is going to be a lot tougher to attack than it had been previously. These guys are starting to get organized. So if you want to give Lamar credit, this is going to his policy is pretty brutal with what happened to the Cherokees, incredibly awful. Uh, but as far as fighting the Comanches, it will be effective in stopping these raids. So the Comanches see what's happened uh, east of this area, and at the same time, something interesting is going to happen. One of the reasons the Comanches hadn't raided too far from their home on the plains is that they'd always had pressure from some of these groups uh, to the north groups we haven't talked about groups like Pawnees uh, and, and things like that Pawnees Kiowas Kiowa Apaches these groups up here they you know if the Comanches stayed too far from their homes these groups would start pushing into their territory well right at the same time Jack Hayes takes over this region um, the Comanche Comanche leadership, and this is going to be members of all the major bands, will meet with members of the Kiowa, uh, Kiowa Apaches, the uh, Pawnees. They're going to sit down at this place called Bent's Fort, and we know about this meeting. People, uh, some of the Indians present, will tell about it later. This is actually a drawing uh, by a Kiowa. He's on a reservation later, representing this meeting. And what they're going to do at this meeting is they're going to basically say to one another. All right, guys, you've constantly attacking us. This this allow this doesn't allow us to raid as far as we would like. Maybe if we make peace with one another, this is you know we won't have to worry about fighting one another, and we won't have to worry about going too far away from our families uh, because we won't worry about you guys attacking us. So uh, you see right here, Ki Comanche and Kiowa things like that. And what this is going to do is get these groups to actually start working together, which up to this point, and actually you'll later on see the Apaches join in this piece. The Apaches and Comanches, never friends. I mean, sometimes you'll see it, but for the most part, they're always fighting each other. But right about 1840, 
you'll see all these Indian groups that previously fight, they make this treaty with one another. And it's right at the same time the Texas Rangers become incredibly effective. So what this is going to allow the Comanches, Kiowas, Apaches to now start doing is instead of worrying about Pawnees up here, I uh, don't have the Kiowas listed, but they'd be right about this area. What they're going to now be allowed to do without worrying about their enemies at their back, and again, not wanting to attack in this direction, they're going to now be able to go on these long, long, long raids away from home. They're not going to raid into this area of it because, again, the Rangers, but what they will start doing is start raiding deep into Mexico. Now, they've been doing this before, but the raids usually went just below the Rio Grande, not too much further than that. But now they're going to be able to go very deep into Mexico. Some people call what's about to happen to Mexico the War of a Thousand Deserts because with these groups working together, they're going to start the forming armies that are essentially in the thousands, two thousands. Actually, people from Mexico will describe uh, two thousand man army armies. And the interesting thing, one other thing that actually is going to allow them to go on these raids is the Comanches, when they used to go on these shorter raids, one thing that they, uh, during the Mexican period, Mexican soldiers would retaliate against them and go north. Well, the Comanches start realizing, hey, these guys start stopping around here, the Rio Grande. So the formation of the Republic of Texas and the fear that if Mexican soldiers invaded Texas area, they not only have to deal with Comanches, but have to deal with the Republic of Texas Army, had prevented retaliation for these uh, attacks. So... The Comanches sort of figure out that there's now an international border here, and so they start attacking every Mexican settlement just about north, or I'm sorry, south of the Rio Grande, and they're going to start turning these settlements, especially smaller settlements, into deserts. That's where the name comes from. A traveler through Mexico describes, I'm seeing a thousand deserts, a place where people used to live that are now just completely burned up. So the way that uh, these raids would happen, Kiowas, Comanches, sometimes Apaches, would head south from the southern plains, cross the Rio Grande. Uh, they'd, you know, ride during the, the night a lot of times. You know, um, sometimes they're riding in such big armies, you could see these clouds of dust uh, from miles away. And you would see Mexican families just, uh, or maybe passengers between towns, see these clouds of dust in, in the horizon. And, you know, first time probably didn't know what it meant, but after, you know, the first time, they, they're going to realize this means these guys are coming and uh, there's not much you can do about it. Well, the Comanches, Apaches, they would set in. They would basically take out these towns. A lot of these towns are just a couple hundred people. You have these warriors come in in the thousands, uh, completely wipe out the town, take all captives from the town, uh, you know, take all the horses, things like that. Sometimes they would just go straight to the next town, completely wipe out th that town. Again, this didn't happen as much before because the Comanches couldn't stay very long to do this, couldn't carry this much stuff because they would worry about retaliation. Now they don't have to worry about retaliation because you have this international border. So these towns will start getting hit left and right. I mean, it's going to completely wipe out uh, northern Mexico. Well, the people of these areas will start calling on the Mexican government. Help us. We're, we're getting killed up here. Please send the army up here. Well, the armies can't deal with this because there's constant turnout over in the government in Mexico City. So nobody wants to send the army up here to the northern frontier because if you send the army away, your political opponents can attack you, take you over. So you need the army down there to protect you. As a matter of fact, one president hears these pleas from uh, the, the governors of these northern states. Please send us uh, uh, help. And he says, Indians don't unmake presidents. So sorry, you know, but that's not my problem. I can't deal with it. You have to deal with it yourself. You actually see some of these governors deal with it by making uh, treaties with these Indians. Hey, we'll let you pass through our territory and, and raid below us if you don't attack anything in our territory, which again, you know, is uh, kind of sounds bad for Mexico as a whole, but if you're entire you know populations getting attacked constantly uh you, that, that you're just going to do what you can do to have them survive um there are a lot of just horrible stories about families you know locking their um uh, children and wives things like that under the house and cupboards you know the uh comanches coming in burning the entire house down people having to watch the floorboards as their dad gets killed things like that um as a matter of fact um 
there's some uh, ghost stories and stuff and from northern Mexico of uh, people getting locked in, in these uh, walls. Like the women of the walls is one of the stories out here where you create these secret rooms so if the Indians raid, they can't get in there. But, you know, the people that are meant to unlock the women all die, so you just end up dying in the walls instead of becoming a uh, captive of the Comanches or Apaches or getting killed by them. So, again, even when there are Mexican soldiers, they, they can't retaliate for these things because if they cross over in this area and try to retaliate, attack the Comanches, uh, Apaches, uh, Kiowas at their homes, you're, you're opening yourself not up to attack, only to attack by them, but also to attack by the uh, uh, Republic of Texas. So, very different approach by Lamar, and this is actually going to be effective when it comes to Plains Indians. Cruel, I would, I would argue, uh, with the East Texas Indians, but effective in stopping these Comanche attacks. So, what about Mexico? So, how is Lamar dealing with Mexico? Well, Mex initially, Lamar, he's going to take over 1839. He initially tries to send a commissioner to Mexico City to sign an agreement recognizing Texas independence. Mexican government, you know, sort of considers overtures, but as we're going to talk about later, they're just pretending. Uh, basically, they are trying to buy time until they can get their forces together, get enough peace within Mexico City to retake Texas. So, essentially, Omar realizes this, realizes that they he has no chance at peace, no chance at getting recognition. So, what Lamar is going to try to do is, again, understanding that if they have peace in Mexico, that means bad for Republic of Texas because it means they can put their army together to attack the Republic of Texas. So what uh, Lamar is going to do is use the uh, forces he has at his command to destabilize Mexico. One of the things he's going to do is, uh, well, he turns the other way when Indians raid. So uh, as he's seeing these Comanches, Apaches uh, come back from uh, Mexico with captives, come back with loot from Mexico just going to turn the other way. Now, tell the rangers, you know, attack them if they come after us, but if they're coming from Mexico, don't worry about it. Another thing he's going to do is uh, support independence movements in other areas. So basically, if Mexico is fighting other groups, they're not fighting the Republic of Texas. Um, in the 1840s, late 1830s, 1840s, a separate independence movement opened up right here in uh, just south of Texas, the area that's today, Nuevo Leon, uh, Tamaulipas, uh, Cohila. Uh, basically, this area, uh, people rebel against Mexico. They call themselves the Republic of the Rio Grande. Lamar is going to end up supporting this group because he realizes that if Mexico is attacking them, they're not attacking Texas. And, and if this is successful, it will support, uh, be sort of a buffer province to Texas. Now, um, gave them some aid. The Republic of Rio Grande will end up being reconquered by Mexico. But uh, um, for a while there, that Lamar was supporting him. Lamar's actually also going to send support to this Republic of the Yucatan. So as we talked about, the there was a Texas Navy being built, Sam Houston, and basically caps canceled future um, uh, future ships being built. But some had already begun the process of or be begun the process of construction. Lamar is going to order them finished, and he's going to send some of these ships to support this independence movement in the Yucatan. So the Mexican Navy will be surrounding the Yucatan trying to prevent these rebels here from getting supplies. Uh, Lamar will send the Yucatan um, uh, re uh, rebels uh, supplies from Texas and he's going to start attacking the Mexican Navy around the Yucatan. Um, now the Texas Navy going to have a handful of, of victorious fights against Mexico but the uh, at sea but for the most part not going to be much success. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, by 1843, a lot of the Texas Navy, one ship has rotted, another ship has sunk, um, and as we're going to see, you know, sailors are going to have problems getting paid, stuff like that. So, again, support these rebellious movements uh, to distract Mexico. Another thing that Lamar is going to do to counter Mexico is he's going to fund in 1841 something called the Santa Fe Expedition. So as we talked about, oh, here'd be a picture of the Texas Navy. One actually interesting thing before we uh, leave the Texas Navy, something, I don't know, uh, for the for the uh, Republic of Texas, something positive will come out of the Texas Navy experience. So besides these handful of victories against Mexico, the one thing that the Texas Navy, and as we'll talk about the Texas Navy, 
going to lose funding very quickly. But one thing that will come out of this uh, Texas Navy experience is that the Texas Navy, as part of um, the arms to its sailors, had ordered this uh, Colt revolver. So there's a guy in the United States, he'd invented a revolver that basically had bullets that you didn't have to reload every time. So Texas Rangers before this, the Texas Army, sailors, every army, basically if you want to fire a gun, you got to load your bullet every single time you fire it, uh, pack it with um, you know black powder, uh, you know, the, the stuffing, uh, the, the ball, you got to stick it in there, you got to fire it off. And then next time you got to fire, you got to reload. So Texas Rangers, sometimes they would bring multiple guns because they realized that if I, um, uh, if I fire my weapon, I'm not going to be able to fire it again for another minute while I'm reloading it. And especially on horses, that was difficult. Well, Texas Navy had ordered these Colt revolvers and what they did is you could load up five shots you could pack them before you got into a fight so when you got into a fight you could fire five times before you had to reload again well the Texas Navy had ordered them they get these shipments of them they're looking at this thing this is neat but how often do sailors use this maybe if you're boarding an enemy ship but not a whole lot of practical value to them and again the Texas Navy not very successful anyway well, the Texas Navy doesn't have much use for these Colt revolvers, but uh, somebody is going to bring these to the attention of Jack Hayes and the Texas Rangers, and they're going to say, wow, this thing would be incredibly useful against the Comanches, because basically, again, you're going against Comanches. If you're trying to reload on horseback, that's almost impossible, and if you can reload, it takes a minute. By that time, Comanches have fired five arrows, you're dead. But this thing right here, you can fire off five shots, quick succession, um, much quicker than even the Comanches can fire their arrows. So what we'll see is that Texas Rangers begin to adopt this. And so whenever Indians raid into uh, the eastern part of the Republic of Texas, this thing is going to be uh, uh, very devastating in, in these battles. So that is something that comes out of the Texas Navy. Uh, but again, the final part of Mirabu Lamar's plan concerning Mexico will be dealing with uh, Santa Fe. Basically, Lamar thinks that, okay, all right, this is the area that had always traditionally been Texas, and this is the area where the vast, vast majority of people that would consider themselves part of the Republic of Texas lives, this area that's in red. Under Spain, Texas had always gone to the Nueces River under Mexico as well. Again, the Coheli, Texas, sort of a little different thing there. But nobody had ever considered the Rio Grande part of Texas until the Treaty of Velasco. Well, this Treaty of Velasco, uh, once this thing is signed, now you, and again, Sam Houston forced uh, Santa Ana to sign to this region because he wanted to buffer between this and Mexico. Well, in putting the Rio Grande there, you didn't incorporate a lot of non-Indians. Basically, before, uh, during the Republic of Texas period, very few people lived in this region, almost nobody really, uh, until, um, as we'll talk about a little bit later, until 18, uh, late 1830s. So nobody lived here, all, only people lived here, Comanches, Apaches, stuff like that. But you did have a handful of settlements over here, in this area that was considered part of New Mexico. So we talked about a long time ago, this area had been settled by Spain. You had people that, by this point, they consider themselves Mexican, and this is considered part of New Mexico. So you had this area that is populated. Well, Lamar looks at this and says, well, according to the Treaty of Alaska, this is part of the Republic of Texas. There are no roads there. Again, you're passing through Comanche territory. There never been roads in the Spanish period, Mexican period. And these areas had always been run by different governments. And again, it's, it's uh, all the way out here. This has completely been disconnected from Texas. But Lamar says, on paper, this is ours. And basically what he's thinking is, uh, um, if I can get claim to this region, there are there's things out here that we don't have access to in Texas, mineral deposits, there's mountains and things like that. Um, and if we can get a trade uh, started from here, Maybe, you know, if we ever get recognition from, from Mexico, maybe we can trade with other areas in New Mexico. Maybe we can trade even down here with the, the deposits down in Chihuahua. And maybe we can even form eventually a, uh, a, a caravan to the Pacific. So what he's thinking is that I'd like to form a trade uh, uh, trade with this uh, the areas of over here. And I'd just like to get into the goods of New Mexico. And by taking, in, or what he would say is, 
enforcing our borders uh you know by by claiming this region through by putting an army out there uh, we'll make this essentially subservient to the Republic of Texas and we'll, we'll increase our economy. So he's going to get about 321 men together. And, and basically, he's got to hire these guys himself as the executive. The Congress is going to look at this and say, you know, I know we, we have this on paper, but these people up here have no connection with us. This, is, this should, probably shouldn't be part of Texas. Um, and they refuse to fund this, this Santa Fe expedition, this expedition sent out to establish... Uh, rule over Santa Fe. Also, you know, look for paths to build a road out in this direction. Uh, but as these guys are, are heading out, Congress can say we're refusing to pay them. So Lamar's basically got to send them out with, you know, IOUs. Uh, we're going to pay you eventually. So these 321 guys uh, under Lamar's direction will head out across the plains uh, to Santa Fe. As they're going out, they're going to be um, a handful of Kiowas that will attack the back of their caravan. Um, so here's Santa Fe. Um, uh, this would be this area. It's nothing like anything within the populated area of the Republic of Texas. Very different agriculture, very different economy. But again, um, uh, Lamar wants to make it a part of the Republic of Texas economy. So as they go out, um, um, so this would be 1841, they're going to um, head across his plains. It's really interesting because, you know, again, some of the uh, caravans at the back will be attacked by Kiowas. We actually have the Kiowas would later on put together this calendar of events, important events, and uh, one of these events for one of these years marks out the uh, Santa Fe expedition, the time they attacked uh, and stole some stuff from the supply caravan behind it. Uh, just know that this is one of uh, uh, even the lesser threats. Like They're going across this area in, in hot time of year, so the men, they're going across an area nobody's explored outside the Comanches. and. Uh, a handful of you know soldiers had uh, Spanish soldiers maybe gone out to this region, but nobody really knew it was out here. So they're going to areas where water holes are very infrequent. So they're thirsty, didn't bring enough food for uh, to eat, and so as they go along, they start to starve, stuff like that. They're going to eventually reach Santa Fe in October 1841, but by the time they get there, they're in no shape to take over Santa Fe. So they basically show up at the gates of Santa Fe and the governor is going to say you guys are arrested. We're, we're, we consider ourselves part of Mexico, not a part of the Republic of Texas and they're going to be arrested. They're going to be then sent to uh, Mexico City to um, uh, face trial. So they're going to be sent down there. Uh, this basically ends any hopes of annexing Santa Fe. Like so, all right, on paper, sure, this is part of the Republic of Texas, but we're not gonna. This isn't gonna happen unless we can somehow magically get some money together, get a much larger army together, find a way across these plains. We're not. Uh, this isn't gonna happen. Uh, another thing here, though, that thankfully for Lamar, this uh, you know some people are gonna say this kind of aggression would deter Britain and France from uh, recognizing Texas, but Britain and France. Uh, they end up recognizing Texas during Lamar's reign. So he is going to accomplish that. So failure Santa Fe, again, Indian thing you can you can view him pretty cruel in one aspect, successful in the other. Um, but another thing that Lamar is going to be criticized for is debt. So Lamar, again, paying guys to go out in the Santa Fe expedition, paying all these Texas Rangers, this is incredibly expensive. So what Lamar's going to do to pay all these uh, men is he's just going to start going into debt, uh, start borrowing money, essentially selling bonds to wealthier residents of Texas, people from the United States. Here's, uh, can I borrow twenty dollars? I'll pay you back thirty dollars in a couple years. You know, just uh, pushing the can down the road, borrowing a lot of money. Um, he's also going to uh, pay off this debt. Um, or increase the debt by just printing out paper money left and right. So Sam Houston had printed out more money than they had as actual specie or gold and silver. Lamar's just going to start printing out this money to the point that he prints out tons of this money, literally tons, uh, and most of it is vast, vast majority is not backed in gold and silver to the point where he prints out so much that a lot of it becomes worthless. So Hey, here, Texas Rangers, I can't pay you in gold or silver, but here's paper money worth this. Pay so much of it out that essentially becomes worthless and, and you know, uh, devalues uh, this new Republic of Texas currency. 
So Lamar absolutely drove Republic of Texas into greater debt. Uh, during just his three years presidency, he spent about uh, $5 million. Uh, it put him at Republic of Texas $5 million additional dollars in debt. Well, Lamar is not going to be able to run an election again in 1841. So he's going to serve 39, uh, 40, uh, 41. There's an election at the end of 1841 for who's going to take over in 42. He's not going to be able to run again. Uh, so the guy that is going to run, the guy that's going to end up winning, will be Sam Houston.